Medial meniscus injuries of the knee can be extremely frustrating and very disheartening if you don't know what they're all about. I've had one personally, but I do understand the mechanism of injury as well as the anatomy surrounding it, which empowers me. I feel empowered. I'm going to empower you today and explain medial meniscus injuries. Here we go. Now we're on to the rehab section, a rehab theory. We've already gone over some quick tips and you know pain relief and some really basics of rehab, but I'm gonna stop everyone right here and just I want you to listen up really quickly because I've done this on the other videos and I wanna make sure that if we're going forward into the video even further that you're going into more of a theory of how to rehab. And if you only care about quick tips and how to make it better immediately, you shouldn't listen to the remainder of this video, honestly. This is reserved for people who really want to understand their condition, want to be able to program their own rehab, be able to talk to their doctor, their therapist, uh, their strength coach about the reasons why they're programming what they're programming. And in the end of it all, you'll get a better understanding of how to program and prevent knee injuries from happening, period. Okay. So again, like I said, if you're not interested in that, you should turn away right now. Before I continue, I want you to, to first know that I know I'm going to talk about a lot of things right now, but uh, I will go into a whiteboard demonstration and lay out some layers or some progressions of rehab that I like to do for meniscal injuries. Now, with meniscal injuries, the first thing you have to understand, and the first thing you have to understand about knees, is that it doesn't like certain movements. It doesn't like rotation, which would be like this, turning from here to here, excessively, and it doesn't like lateral bend. Now, can it do those motions? Yeah, I just showed you it could. The meniscus, or sorry, the knee in general rotates about five degrees either direction, roughly. But beyond that, it doesn't like it. And especially it doesn't like it when you're putting repetitive loads upon it, say with running with poor mechanics. Now consider knee braces for meniscus injuries and even ACL injuries. Okay, the knee, the knee brace, it's usually a bar with a dial. And the same thing goes on the other side. And the reason why this is, is because it's limiting that lateral bend, which is like, I can't even do it. So this would remain straight and this would go like a T, like tick, 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 and rotation. And the reason why we're decreasing that is because an unstable knee, at least with an ACL injury, is not able to control that motion. So we need to protect it from subjecting itself to that movement. Now, when it comes to rehabbing the area, you could put a knee brace on it and just leave it at that. But realistically, there's more of a thought process now that if we subject our body and subject our knee to small doses of the poison that is rotation and lateral bend through movement and especially exhausted movement, which we do it running all the time, then we're going to make it more resistant to knee injuries and more resistant to meniscal injuries. Okay. If you've watched the video or if you haven't watched the video on runner's knee already in the series, you should go back. And at the very tail end, I go over actually a whiteboard demonstration of how neuromuscular fatigue, or when form breaks down, it creates all these knee conditions. Okay, they might present as a different type of thing. You might have a meniscal injury versus a runner's knee or chondromalacia patella, but really a lot of the mechanism is the same. Okay, just whatever breaks first. So as we go forward, just remember, we're resisting lateral bend and rotation, but also to let the body learn how to do that, we have to subject it to small doses in a controlled setting and then increase the speed and fatigue as we go. Let's go to the whiteboard. All right, now we're on to the good stuff. We're on to the uh, progression of knee conditions or the progression of meniscal rehab. So I wrote this all out for you so you wouldn't have to wait for my uh, slow riding skills. But basically the progression of, of how we go is based upon the structure that's involved. Okay, in this case, we're talking about the meniscus. So uh, in contrast, you might say we have runner's knee. Runner's knee, the undersurface of the kneecap is involved, so it has a little bit of a different presentation and, and people can't do certain things. An example would be a, a knee condition, um, or sorry, a meniscal condition. Uh, they might not be able to bend the knee completely, approximating the heel to the butt. And with uh, runner's knee, a lot of times they can't even press, put pressure on the cap or they can't squat below 90. So a lot of these exercises in here might, might change slightly based upon what the person can and can't do. So first, I like to start with global stabilization and 
In the past, a lot of times we started with local stabilization, which means that we give exercises specifically for in and around the knee. And I have put a couple videos out, uh, such as uh, quad sets and heel digs and stuff like that, which are a little bit more targeted to surrounding the knee or local stabilization, which does have its place. But the problem is, is if we don't have global stabilization, which means stabilization or, you know, or really good function of the areas above and below the knee, then we're not gonna have local stabilization either. So we kinda gotta have both. And the, and the idea uh, came out, I think about uh, five years ago or so, where they were saying, if you have a distal injury such as the knee, distal meaning further away from the body or the trunk, then we have to have proximal stabilization, which I do love the whole concept of it, but really we have to have both if we have a actual structure involved to a certain degree. So global stabilization might be things like, um, might be bridges, it might be uh, planks, it might be part of the uh, Trendelenburg test like we showed on here, it might be uh, a lot of things, it might be lunges, squats, and so on. Local stabilization, like I talked about, it's right around the knee itself, so it's more of the conventional uh, PT exercises that you'd see for knees, or corrective exercises for the actually around the knee. Now, a two-legged challenge, all this really means is we are challenging the body in a closed chained or foot on ground environment. And the reason why we do this is because that is how we function in everyday life. That's how you function when you run, you have foot in contact with the ground. So two legs, we start with that mainly because it's more safe and we can put a little bit more weight upon the people. Uh, so squats, deadlifts, and small knee bends are examples of things that I would possibly put into here as well as lunging. Um, these are all good, good options in here. So once we've really mastered uh, a two-legged challenge, I like to go to a single leg challenge. And a lot of times we drop the weight significantly, such as uh, imagine a single, a double-legged squat versus a single-legged squat. This one is a lot more wobbly. Um, there's a lot less possibility to put more weight upon it. Um, so we gotta definitely uh, check form here before we go into a single leg one here. Now, when I talked about uh, exposing yourself to the poison, this is where we're at in the rotational and lateral bend challenge. And it's not that we try to make the joint actually do that, but we try to resist the joint from doing that. And by joint, I guess I mean the entire limb. So in regards to stuff I would give here, I might give a rotational squat or an airplane. And if you've watched the other exercise or the other videos on knee conditions for runners, then you've probably seen an airplane already. Um, so an airplane is a really wobbly one. You want to do it to the best of your ability where you still succeed, but it's still challenging, okay? It's the high, it's I guess the lowest level of, um, not failure, but uh, a competency, okay? You need to make sure we're continually working on imp improving our body's ability to resist rotation and lateral bend. Now, you might wonder, when am I gonna get back to running again? Well, we've done all this stuff, and then, so now we have slow and uh, quicker based plyometrics. And if you consider what running is, it's basically a, a quicker based plyometric. So the reason why I like doing slow first is because we're working on mainly control, okay? Can you stack the joints? Can you resist rotation? Can you resist lateral bend? But now we're doing it in a jumping, bounding fashion. So an example of something I might give here is a hop hold. And if you've seen people do repeated hops, then they're doing more of this. They're doing rebound, okay? They're working on the stretch, um, stretch response as well with the, with the tendons and muscles, but also too, we need to make sure we have support before we can produce power, okay? So I like to have people they land and they stick it and hold it. And I want to be able to, I tell them a lot of times, if you can, you should be able to stay there and I should be able to take a picture of you and have no motion blur if I had a, if I had a long shutter speed, okay? You should be like a statue waiting there. And then we go again. Now we go into this and you should, hopefully you should have your control down and you go down to a more of a rebound. Now, this is a little bit different than, I guess some people think of plyo. Some people think of plyo as just mainly jumping, but realistically it's, it's jumping in multiple directions, okay? So they would consider this more in the realm of, of agility drills. So I say half, half speed agility drills. And with agility, they usually think of cone drills on a field, or at least in the running world, I've noticed. So agility drills are great because what we're working on is, again, the resistance of, say we do a side to side shuffle, stop, pause, and go back. And this is the resistance of, again, that caving to the side, that lateral bend. Okay, and if we maybe go 
this way and then go into a 90 degree pattern, we're resisting some rotation, okay? So doing this half speed and really focusing on the ability to change direction is really, really important before we go to 75% and then 100% and basically in and around this realm, you're doing more running and that's really where you want to be. So this is a rough flow of everything. Um, again, it does jump a little bit, like I said, if we have a little bit more structure involved, say the meniscus is completely frayed away and just torn to bits, then we probably got to start on local a little bit more readily than global. And if it's just a minor meniscal tear, I'd probably start in global more so than local. Or if there's not a tear at all and there's, there's, there's just knee pain, but there's not any really positive MRI findings or ultrasound findings, then we're going to start at global because there's not a real structural problem. And if you don't understand that concept I said right there, I do have a, have a podcast coming out on types of tears or levels of tears, and I believe it's going to be around uh, the high 40s, but you should look at it because it's the current classifications of at least soft tissue tears and tendon and muscle tears, more so than this is a cartilage tear, but it still kind of applies roughly the same. Now, I know all that seems really confusing, but it doesn't have to be. A lot of times I like to show these to people to show there is a progress that we're going through, and as long as you just kind of take the exercises given in those certain sections, then we're going to be pretty good. And now we can blend this a little bit, and it's not necessarily black and white how we wrote it out as in levels, because a lot of times it's dependent upon what the person or what you could do at each level, and you might be really bad at one level and then great at another, so we kind of blend them together. Now, again, if it seems really confusing, we do have an actual course that we're working on at Performance Place, and I'll put a link in the description below uh, it's not live at the time of me publishing this video. Okay, I'll let you know that first off. We're still developing it at the time and we're trying to make it so, make it so it's really easy for everyone to understand, making it so you're not afraid of knee rehab and so that you completely understand that there's just a process going on. Because a lot of times people get overwhelmed by how many things are thrown at them by a paper, by their PT or their, their therapist. And a lot of times they don't do it because there's just too much stuff. So we're trying to make it really easy in this course. And again, it's not intended to actually be a way for you to rehab yourself, but realistically it's the stuff that we go through here to rehab people. So it's very, very educational or it's going to be when it's created. So check that out. The link is in the description below. And if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel here, please thumbs up right now. Share with a friend who has a knee condition and then uh, subscribe to it. You'll get all the videos right when they come out. So I'll speak with you guys soon.